our next speaker uh, is Karolina Ketukari from Finland. Uh, Karolina is a Modern Work Lead and Advisor and Microsoft MVP. Uh, she her specialty is uh, developing teamwork and internal communications with the help of Microsoft Teams, and she is an active speaker and at technology conferences and organizer of community in Finland. So um, just don't 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 forget that we are going to record all this. So if you miss something, we'll give it to you at the end. So I'm kind of ready to give the torch to Carolina. Do we have Carolina online? Yes, I'm here. Hello. hello. Carolina, hello. And we are ready to hear a presentation now. Awesome. Let me just share my screen. And are you able to see my presentation now? Yes. Cool. Okay. So let's start. So basically, we are having about 35 minutes of presentation. And after the presentation, I can answer to all of your questions. I hope I can answer those uh, pretty pretty clearly. But yeah, uh, during this uh, first hour, we are focusing on where is the return on investment in Microsoft Teams user adoption. And of course, after my presentation, there will also be George Lucas session and Andy, Andy Hanegat session about Power Platform and uh, access control and sharing in Teams. So stay tuned after this session as well. But yeah, Tony already introduced me, but just a couple of words about myself. So I'm Karona Kettori, I come from Finland, and I am a Microsoft MVP in Office Apps and Services. And yeah, um, everything I do revolves around Microsoft Teams and developing teamwork in general communications with all of these new cool tools we have at use. And uh, yes, I love to speak at conferences and user groups. And if you want to know more about me, you can always go and check out my website and connect me in LinkedIn and in Twitter. You can find me from Twitter with my last name, Ketukari. Okay, but let's get started with our theme of today. So, first of all, when we are thinking about return on investment, we are usually thinking about money. And we have some goals we want to measure to see if we have succeeded in our projects. So if all of the money we have used in our team's adoption has paid off. And during the past years, 2018, 2019, team's adoption was super easy. We just had one target to, to measure the adoption. And it was daily active usage, usage rate. And these are, uh, this is data from one of my customer projects I did a couple of years ago. And basically, it was a very typical project. So we started with zero active usage. And then during six months, maybe under a year, the percentage of active users has risen from zero to about 80%. Even 60% at that time was considered, was considered a success. So it was super simple and super easy to show those managers that, hey, our team's implementation project, our team's adoption project was successful. So it was really a good investment to pay those dollars or euros in your adoption project. But we all know uh, what happened during the last year. So things got um, a little fast forward, I, I might say. You may have seen this um, picture in, in Twitter or, or in social media. And basically what happened last year was this. May, if, you, if you saw Tony's presentation just before me, you also saw these same numbers. But I want to repeat those in here because I think those are massive numbers and it's a huge drastic change. So during one year, from March 2020 to April 21, uh, Teams received over 100 million daily active users more in just one year. And now you might think, 
that if 2018, 2019, we had all of those teams adopt some project and our goal was to set the team's daily active use rate up to 60%, up to 80%. And now basically everyone are using teams. Do we still need user adoption? So is there really any reason anymore to budget some money on Teams adoption because everyone are using Teams already because of the situation. We are working remotely. I'm here in my kitchen all day long working in front of my computer using Teams every day. So maybe we need new goals. Maybe the active user measurement isn't the only success factor in our team's implementation projects anymore. And it's also good to keep in mind that when we are talking about uh, daily active usage, Microsoft means that it's a people or, or person who has opened tight teams and maybe read some conversation in teams channel or maybe written one chat, one message in chat in teams. So basically the active usage means that you have opened Teams and done something in Teams. And I don't know if that's really real active usage. Maybe not. So let's take a look at some research studies. So we have also gotten so, so many new super cool researches during the past year. And I want to go through some numbers, what all these drastic changes has, has meant to the 145 million daily active users. Because uh, what it means in Teams user adoption that we are going to have or we are having at the moment almost 150% more weekly meetings than before. So uh, Microsoft did these um, studies last year and this year and they have compared those numbers and this year, people have, have been having almost 150% more weekly meetings than, than the year before. And it's a huge amount of meetings. And of course, it's so, it's so easy, it's so simple to set, set up a Teams meeting when you are just at your home. You don't have to use your time to commute to home, to workplace and back. And basically, you have gained a little bit of more time in your working day. And it's super easy to use the time to sit just a couple of meetings more per day. Is it a good thing? I don't think so. Maybe not, but it's a fact. And other quite whopping fact was that it's not just teams. It's not just meetings in teams. It's not only chats and conversation we have in teams channels. It's also, of course, emails. And other study told us that over 40 billion emails were delivered from February 2020 to February 21. So that's a huge amount of data, huge amounts of information, text, documents sent via email. And of course, all of this data, information, meetings, we maybe are a bit bit uh, we, we have this bit of a fatigue of all of all of all this new remote working mode and when we are thinking about user adoption it's also nice to share some of these other uh, research studies because uh, at the moment many companies are thinking about hybrid work strategies and what happens when we are getting back to the offices so we are thinking that maybe this remote working situation isn't going to last forever. At least I hope so. I would very, very much love to be at the office with my, with, with my colleagues. But maybe time to time, it's still nice to be at your home. So over 70% of the employees want these flexible situations to stay. And I think that's also one thing we really, really have to take into account for when we are planning some Teams user adoption project, that how are we going to effectively collaborate and communicate when we are partly remote and partly at the office?
so that we are in this new hybrid working mode. And it might be challenging because even at the moment, almost 40% of the managers feel like it's, it's pretty hard to ensure the team spirit, to keep up the team spirit and team connection when we are working remotely. And uh, one, one number that all, always caught my eye is that when we want to create something new, when we want to innovate, when we want to build something, create something, collaborate on some new documents, only one in every three managers believe that we can do it, that we are capable of doing it uh, when we are working remotely. And actually, the number has significantly dropped from 2019, where still 40% of the managers had the belief that we are capable of being innovative. And that's an interesting number because we, we have all the technology, we have teams, we have all of those applications, solutions inside Teams and Microsoft 365. We can use to be innovative. And still only one in third manager believe that we are able to utilize those tools. So we have the capability, the technical cap capability of being innovative, but in reality, we don't have the ability to use those tools. And the ability, of course, comes from successful Teams user adoption. And when you're thinking about knowledge sharing, and I know you maybe think that knowledge workers are only the people sitting in offices or sitting in front of their computers the whole day. But even the more nowadays, also first-line workers are knowledge workers. And we have so, so many uh, solutions, applications we use to share knowledge. We have, of course, email because everyone loves email. We have internet. We have meetings, live meetings, remote meeting, meetings, hybrid meetings. We have maybe some kind of file sharing tools, project management tools, databases. And then we have social networking tools, Yammer, Teams, uh, knowledge sharing tools, yet again Teams. And uh, one thing that really was interesting in this study was that uh, third, 30% 30 of people are still using printed memos. So they really want to use the printer and print out those documents. And um, we have all of these different tools to share knowledge. And what about we wouldn't need all of those different applications? What if we could always use those applications, those different tools inside one window and inside one place? It's about Teams as platform, Teams as the hub for teamwork. And we really can uh, replace most of these different tools with Teams or implement those tools inside Teams. I know also email, we can get rid of most of our emails if we are starting to use Teams properly. But it, it doesn't come uh, automatically. It doesn't come just go and, go and use. So we need time to train people how to use those tools. But then, are we really investing in training? Are we really investing in Teams user adoption? Probably not. Because only 20%, so one in every fifth person in the study, said that their company has invested a lot of time in training knowledge sharing tools, such as Teams. I, I find it pretty happy, it's, it's pretty okay, that 31% said that, okay, we, we got some training. We, we maybe know some, something like a little bit more. But what's really concerning is that almost half of the people or, or half of the people interviewed in the study said that they had little to none training in, in those knowledge sharing tools. So no, no user adoption, all of these different tools, what it means to the employees, what it means to the day-to-day day -day working life. 
when we are sending emails, writing messages to teams, trying to search for those bits of information which are in 20 different uh, solutions and applications across our systems. That means that we waste time. We waste time and of course by wasting time we waste money. And it's pretty staggering that we can spend up to seven weeks per year just searching for information in all of these different information sharing tools we have. Up to seven weeks per year just recreating information we already have but we just don't know it exists or we don't know where to find it. So we are really, really throwing money away. It's super expensive not to train people to use these tools we have. We can actually count how much, uh, how much money we lose every, every day or every year. If you can count, for example, how much does it cost for an hour per, per how much one working hour costs. For example, if it's a um, 15 euros per hour, so you are going to lose the 15 hours, uh, 15 euros every day. If you have 100 employees or 1,000 employees, 10,000 employees, and all of these, all of your employees are losing up to seven, seven weeks per year just by searching for information. You can really count the euros you are going to lose if you are not doing team setup some properly. Because the thing is that when you think about those numbers I showed you before, that everyone are using Teams at the moment. We are using Teams because we have to use Teams. We are not able to work remotely in any other way. And this leads into this picture. Um, this is taken from from a Microsoft, uh, some Microsoft uh, deck. I don't I don't actually remember which, which one, but as you can see, it starts with number one: plan your team's adoption. It's a super super smart thing to start with. You should plan your team's adoption and then move on to the next phases. Of course, the first phase uh, or second phase in, the, in this case with Teams is to have those Skype capabilities in use. So you can have meetings in Teams, you can chat in Teams. So Teams is the replacement for Skype. And when you have that basic things going on, you can chat in Teams, you have meetings, everything's running smoothly, then you really get to see interesting stuff. So you get to develop your teamwork in Teams. You get to use Planner, To-Do, OneNote, all of those applications you have in Teams. And then you get to the Power Platform part of Teams or Microsoft 365, where you can streamline processes, automate workflows, do all those super, super cool stuff with Teams. And the thing is that when I talk to my customers, I ask employees, I ask managers, are you using Teams? And of course, they are saying, yes, of course, I'm using Teams. I'm using Teams every day. And then when we get a bit deeper into the conversation, so what are you using in Teams? Do you use OneNote? Do you use, do you use Planner? How do you know how to control your notifications? People are Oh no, no, I just used meetings and chat in Teams. And basically, companies are stuck with the Skype version of Teams. Companies are stuck with the chat and meeting capabilities in Teams. And when we think about Teams as a hub for, for team, teamwork, Teams as a platform, that's super expensive to use only the 1% of Teams, 1% of all the things, all the applications your licenses have to offer. Because you have to pay for all the applications, all the licenses for every employee, every month. And they are not cheap. I know Microsoft, uh, Microsoft licenses 
or not that cheap. So what's the point in paying all that stuff when you are using only a small percentage of teams? And of course, the answer to this is that you should really, really start with the phase number one. So planning your team's adoption and investing in team's adoption. So when you are talking with managers, or if you are a manager yourself, and you are thinking about how much money should be put in teams adoption projects, how much time, how much resources should we invest in this? I think it's, it's maybe the wrong question to ask. It's more that if we don't invest in teams, in, in teams adoption, what happens then? And how much it's going to cost us cost if we don't do user adoption? Are we then paying, paying for all of our licenses, paying all of, all of those technical capabilities and using only a small friction of those? Is it wise? Is it wise to invest heavily in technology, in cloud environments and use only a friction of all of that? I don't think so. Also, another interesting question is that what if our competitors do it? So what if the companies who do the same thing as we do, they are using Teams in every way possible. So they are using all the automations. They don't lose their time in finding documents. They don't lose one hour per day for searching documents or recreating information. But we do. How much competitive advantage it creates to other companies and how much far behind we are, we, we leave, we are, we, we are being left if we do not invest in teams adoption in the same way as the, all the other companies are doing. Um, I have this one, one quote in here. Uh, it, it's usually said that uh, I think Charles Darwin had said this one, but actually it was Leon C. Megison who went through some Darwin's uh, studies. And uh, he said that the species that survives is, is the one that's best able to adapt and, and adjust to the changing environment. And um, I really like this quote because it's all the time so, um, it's all the time important. And uh, it's fun because the first time I showed this quote was in, in 2019 in, in one conference. I talked about the same topic, topic. and uh, then after, after that conference, of course, happened COVID and all the stuff. And now this is ever more important, ever more interesting. And the way we are being able to adapt and just uh, and adjust, it's not just giving yet another technologies to our employees. Like go and use Teams, go and use Zoom, go and use uh, go to webinar. It's about how to best train your employees to use tools, use those tools. And when it comes to Teams, it's a wrong question to ask nowadays. Are you using Teams? Because we all are using Teams. Instead, we should be asking, are you using Teams effectively? Are you using all the relevant applications in M365? Are you using Teams not only as Skype, replace, re, Skype replacement, but also for OneNote planner, uh, forms, whatever you have in there? And are people happy with Teams? Because the thing is that I hear so much frustration with Teams. I hear all of these comments and discussions that I have so many notifications. I don't want to use Teams because I get so many notifications every day. And the thing is, you can be the king of your own notifications. You can set up your own, control your own notification settings. And, uh, and get just the way amount of notifications you want to. But people don't know that because you haven't trained your people 
to how to take control of your notifications. So it can be super simple things. Teams user adoption doesn't have to be right away deep diving into Power Platform. It can be just how can you control team notifications, how do you organize your teams, organize your channels, and how can you utilize, uh, for example, OneNote with your team or, or Planner with your team. So you can start with very simple stuff and then gradually go deeper and deeper in the technologies. And I really like the question, are people happy with using Teams? Do, do people feel like Teams is helping them in their working, working daily life? Because you might have noticed that the new hype word of today is employee experience. So thematic word that should make everything better. And as you also might know, it doesn't happen by itself. And employee experience is something you should really measure when you think about implementing teams in your company. So it's not just about are people using Teams? What's the daily active usage rate? How many chats or channels we, do we have? How much information do we share inside Teams? You should also measure about are people happy with using Teams? And uh, we have all this technology. We have all of these applications. But luckily, uh, we also have these applications where we can support people and empower employees to have the better employee experience. So I think we are pretty far away from just uh, implementing Teams technically and writing an email message to people or writing one news in our internet, which says that, hey, Teams is here, go and use. I think we are past that. Everyone knows how to open Teams, but it might be that. So we have the technology, but people don't know how to use these technologies, and they don't know how to use the technology effectively unless you invest in user adoption. So actually the technology, all of these, all of these applications, they don't solve your problems, but user adoption solves your problems. But we have some things you should think about, you should utilize, and everything should start with good governance. So when you are thinking about or planning your user adoption campaign, your user adoption project, you should always also plan your governance. So it can be technical stuff, it can be about teams lifecycle, who can create teams, uh, what's the naming conventions for teams, but also governance about what happens when you notice that there are, no, there are teams which no one uses anymore. Because if you think about employee experience and you have like 20 teams inside your team and maybe 10 of those teams are empty, nothing has happened in those teams in the last six months. Is it good employee experience? I don't think so. So also governance, is a match for, for improving employee experience. Um, you may also have heard about Microsoft Viva, which is a new employee experience platform in Teams. And uh, I think the thing with Viva is also that you should think about how to adopt it. It's, it's, it, it's not going to work if you just say to your employees that, hey, with Viva Connections, we now have our SharePoint implement in Teams. It's this cute little home button in here. Click the home button and you can go to our internet in Teams. Yes, technically it, it works like that, but you should also tell people why does it make your work, work day better? How much easier it is when you can access relevant news, relevant information inside your Teams and you don't have to open browser, go to internet separately. And those are also the things you should think about 
when you are you're planning your user adoption campaign. So how do you communicate about those new technologies and about those new changes? Cool. We are getting getting at the end of the presentation. So maybe a little wrap up before we before we move on to take QA if you have some questions. So when we think about teams adoption and when we when we think about return on investment, it's usually the money that comes first into mind. But the money part, I think it's it's easy to measure. We can count, we can have researches, we can do studies of how much money we are losing every day. For example, when we are searching for documents, we do not find. We can count how much money we are paying for our licenses every month or every year. And it's super easy to make those Excel or whatever and make those counts on how much more, how much money, how much time you could save if you invest, for example, in teams trainings, people go to trainings, people know how to find their information better and you will save time. But of course, it's it's not that simple because what do you do with the time you save? So if you think about those employees in the study I showed you and the employees say they save, uh, they lose one hour every day when they don't find the information they are looking for. So let's imagine you have one hour, one extra hour in your workday. What do you do with the extra hour? Do you just like drink coffee? Do you watch Netflix takes the extra hour? You have to plan that. And maybe by making teams things simpler, by training your employees to use all of different Teams applications more effectively gives you more time to focus on some important tasks during your working day. Or maybe after a while you can take steps towards, for example, building power apps, building automations, which then again, yet maybe save some time for, for the employees. And when we're thinking about measuring the successful or su success of Teams user adoption projects. I, I really like the concept of are people happy with Teams? We, we hear so much about the frustration, we are struggling every day, we are not being innovative, we, we are spending time. So if you really invest in user adoption, not only technical trainings, but how people can utilize those team working tools together to collaborate, communicate as a team or together in a project. We are able to make employees happier. And happy employee is more productive employee. And happy employee is more likely to stay in your company in the future as well. Okay. Thank you for, for my part. I hope you got some new uh, ideas and tips and tricks about how can you convince your managers to invest in Teams user adoption? How can you count if the investment counts or gives you a return on your investment? And, and maybe also you got some ideas about how money, so return on investment and, and user adoption projects are also in line with employee experience. And maybe this softer side of change, the human side of, of Teams adoption. Cool. I hope um, you have an awesome day. And I also hope you enjoy shorties and, and this presentation after, after this one. Hello. Hello, Carolina. Thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, we are going to switch to a short demo and then we will be back with Q&A for you. So we just got some questions and we would like to, to discuss those with you. So, but now I would like to bring on Mattia, who is our lead 
developer on Syskit Point to, for him to show us a little demo on how can Syskit Point help you with Office 365 analytics and adoption. So, Matti, are you ready? Yeah, thank you, Tony. Can you just confirm you see my screen? Yes, yes. Welcome home, it okay. says. Welcome, welcome, Excellent. Matia. So, hi, all. I hope you all enjoyed Carolina's presentation as much as I did. And you actually saw how important adoption is. So, I'm happy to show you how Syskit Point can help you to measure adoption and basically how to measure some most, most important usage metrics inside the tool. So, as you can see uh, on the home screen, Syskit Point is more than just an adoption tool. It's a comprehensive uh, Office 365 governance solution. It's not just for admins, it can also be used for business users. So basically, if you're a business user, you can come into the application and you'll only be able to govern and see the workspaces that you actually own. So if you're a team owner or a group owner or a SharePoint site admin, you'll be able to govern those resources with the application. So besides that, the application includes Office 365 inventory, access reporting, governance and policy enforcement. Uh, more than that, we'll show in the following demo, not in this one. And you'll also be able to manage the complete life cycle of the workspace, so basically from creation to the end of life, and you even have proactive security alertings. So for this first demo, our time is limited, so we'll just focus on the Microsoft 365 Teams. So first thing that I want to show you is basically uh, what you can see inside Syskit Point in the main Microsoft Teams and Group screen. So if we focus on Teams, we can uh, quickly filter only Teams using our main application filters. And right from here, you can see how many Teams do you have, which of them are public, which of them are private, which is basically very important, especially for security purposes. And you see other basic information about the team. So what's, what's happening with the members, owners, does it have guests? And what's pretty cool that straight from here, you can see if the team is actually being used actively. And that is determined on multiple criteria. So it's not just if you are using the chat, but if you are putting files inside that team or sending emails to that team, basically will detect all of that. And that's important if you remember what uh, Carolina said, that if you have a lot of unused teams inside your Teams application client, so it's going to be harder to figure out and find when you actually have messages, you have to scroll a lot. So it's not that convenient. Other thing that you can see which can be useful to measure the adoption of private channels. So uh, a new feature came out, it was called private channel. So did your users start using it? From here, you, it's pretty easy. You just filter and you instantly get all the teams which have private channels. You can even see the number of private channels here. And the last thing on this screen I want to show you is basically the inactive groups, which includes teams. And what's pretty cool about this, so right from here, you can decide, I want to do something about this. So maybe you are certain what you want to do and you basically instantly do an action. Maybe you want to archive them or delete them or say, okay, I want to keep them so it's not going to be marked as inactive. But if you're not sure, what you usually have to do is then ask the owners. And to avoid all that manual work, what you can do is actually request an access review where you actually give tasks inside Syskit Point to the team owners so they need to decide what to do with that team. Uh, more than that, on the following demo. So we'll just focus more on the adoption part. Uh, one cool thing that you can also do here is actually you can be alerted when somebody creates a team. So it's easily, easily to specify alerts. And under the category Microsoft Teams, you can say, hey, I want to be alerted because I'm a Syskit Point admin. Just send me an email if somebody created a team so I can check if that's okay. Or you can specify somebody else as a recipient as ever suits your need. Okay, so the next thing that I want to show you is that actually you can also click on each of the teams to get a lot more details. So I'm clicking on my QA team 
And you'll notice here, besides the standard information about members' channels, you have also the section about usage. So what we are going to show you is not just the team's usage, which includes how many active channels do I have, how many messages are inside the channels, what are the top active channels, top active users, what percentage of the users is active, and what's pretty cool about that, everything is drillable. So if I click on view all, I'm going to see all the channels and all the data. Uh, if I go back, I can do the same for most active users. So I, I can see basically each user inside that channel, how many messages were sent. But besides the actual team activity, I can also see the site activity. And site activity basically means files inside that team. So are people putting files inside a team? And how many people inside the team are actually using files? So that's also one, let's say, important adoption metric because you want them to use the team's application in its fullness. So not just chatting, but also store files there, use planner and all the other workloads. So currently, you notice that we have SharePoint and Teams, but more workloads will come in the future. So uh, next thing that I want to show you is the dashboards. So straight from here, you will be able to see the inventory, how many of each workspace type do you have? And if you had new Teams in the last 30 days, you would also see a small graph here, but this is a demo environment, so not a lot of things gets created. You also see different things like how many users do we have? How many external users? And on how many sites and documents do those users actually have permissions? Also information about licenses and also things that we are going to talk about in the second demo. So have you configured regular access reviews to be performed on those teams, those groups, those sites? And do you have some sort of automation regarding the end of life? for teams, making sure that they are removed once they are no longer needed. But the focus of this demo is Microsoft Teams. So we'll just switch to that dashboard. And straight from here, you can see uh, basically how Teams is being used during the week. And as you would expect on Sunday, nobody's using Teams. So that's good. We don't want to disturb the people on their free time. But you also see, the most active teams and the most active channels. And what's cool that like in all the other places, you can actually just drill down and see the data for all the teams, not just the top five, but all the teams. So you can do that for the most active teams, for the more ac most active channels. Then you see, okay, this is the channel name, this is the team, team name, and those are the messages and how many unique users actually posted those messages. If we go back here, we also see a section about messages. And you can actually distinguish between channel messages and those one-on-one -on -one chats. So are your users referring to put messages in chats or are they basically speaking privately, one-on-one? -on -one? Of course, this is also drillable. So you can see all the information about each user and who is active. Uh, the next thing that you can analyze here and what's, let's say, important for that option, how people are actually interacting in meetings. So are they using screen sharing? Are they using video or just audio? And which platforms are they connecting to? So are they using their mobile phones, Windows, tablets, or something else? And you can also distinguish between meetings and group calls. Uh, other statistics you can actually see here is how many people are joining the meetings. How long do they have and how many meetings do we have? And is that number increasing over time? So some of these metrics are actually available in the Microsoft Admin Centers. But uh, one of the advantages here is actually that you can use a longer period than 90 days. You can actually check adoption for a longer period and see is the number of meetings increasing over time. Uh, another cool thing is that if I were to use basically a business user, which is a team owner, it could come to this basic point and see just the statistics for the teams that he is the owner of. So basically, in a central place, he can see all the data for all his teams. It's not 
team, basically team per team. It's easier to get a bigger picture. And the last thing I want to show you here, let's go back to seven days, is the adoption part. So what we currently support is the Teams and SharePoint adoption, where you can instantly see, do you have some champions who are very good at adopting certain workloads? And those people can actually help you figure out how to train the rest of the people to use it. And what you can also see is by department, how they're using each workload. So this can help you target, okay, Marketing is not using Microsoft Team meetings a lot. Maybe you just need to focus some adoption efforts to the marketing department. And you can also show this by users. And what you also can see down here is basically adoption over time. So not a lot of data on, on this demo environment. So I only have data from one month, but you would see the changes over time from month to month. Uh, the next thing that I want to show you guys is basically some cool reports on meeting interactions. So you can actually see how people are in interacting on meetings. So if I just select, show me how marketing is having meetings in the last six months, I run the report and I can see people interactions, both as a graph in the middle or numerical values at the side. So I can see here that actually two users, Victoria and Bruce, for some reason are not communicating on the meetings with the rest of the marketing department. So maybe they have some side project and this is okay, but maybe they should be and something is wrong. What's also cool that you can actually drill down here and once again, get all the base numbers of actually who is on a meeting with who and how many times did they have calls or something. And the last thing that I want to show you is we go back to reports. This is more focused on SharePoint activity. So when we are talking about teams, this actually means the files. And if we go to this report, we can pick specific teams. Let's use the QA team again and one other team. Let's say, look at the last 30 days, run the report. And here you'll see some nice looking statistics but you can actually compare, you see that the green is the project winners and the blue one is the QA team. So you can compare how many users were interacting either with the files or directly on the SharePoint site per week, per day. And you see the most active users, the most active devices, uh, break down that by day. And you can also, once again, chill down for that. And this view can also be, let's say, looked at different ways. So you can just focus on sites, you can focus on pages, or you can only focus on documents. And basically you see here that for each category, you see the top five, but you have the ability to drill down and see all the documents, their location, how many hits do they have, and how many visitors do they have. And the same can be done for the sites. And you can even select, like I said, more than 90 days. And what you also have an option, if you want to see an aggregate of all your sites and not individually, then you can just switch to aggregate. And basically, this is what I wanted to show you in the first demo. So uh, it's time to go back to Tony. Thank you. Thank you, Mattia. Uh, we are now ready to go back to questions with uh, Carolina. Is Carolina still with us? Yes, I am here if there are any questions. Yeah, so uh, a lot of questions we got uh, focuses on uh, what is the best practice for something. So um, I guess these questions are a little bit harder to answer. So um, uh, let's start with, with some of the good ones, uh, the great ones, I would say. Uh, uh, the, the question is, if we create a good knowledge base, uh, what would you recommend as a good way to keep this knowledge base up to date? I think that comes down to ownership of knowledge. So whether you have, for example, pages in SharePoint or knowledge in documents, you should always have an owner for every page, every section in, in SharePoint, in Teams or in your knowledge base. 
and the owner is responsible for keeping the information up to date. It's not easy, but I think it's the only only yeah. real way to go. What what do you find is good sources of knowledge these days? Where do you learn more? Because Office 365 uh, keeps changing rapidly. Like, uh, where do you educate yourself, and where do you find new knowledge? Um, actually, I I find most of the, uh, most of knowledge about or information about new things in Teams in from Twitter. So I follow some uh, accounts in Twitter, and then those are so so. Uh, quick to write if there are any any changes in teams but if you think about normal employees or normal users in in our companies teams have an own section when something has changed for example today when i opened my teams it ha had this little pop-up saying that did you know that you can now control control your st status message in teams so you can also go to teams and the help section and then it will tell you what's new in teams Okay. Uh, another question revolves around how do we, we, we always have some employees that uh, might not follow the knowledge base that are using the teams in, in, a, in a wrong way, like Matthias showed earlier in his example. Do you have any best practices that would relate around how do we make sure that everybody is participating in conversations in a proper way, that the way that company designed or the best practice, global best practice to use the system? Yeah, I think in every company we have people who are very eager, the first ones to adopt new technologies and things in Teams. And then we have those who are really, I, I don't want to say change resistant, but they stuck to their, their old habits. And one of the things I've uh, proven success, successful with, with those kinds of people are that you have one-to-one -one conversations with them. And also one-to-one -one conversations works well with the top management, if, if you want to. So basically just have a, have a Teams meeting, listen to him or her, what do they have to say, what, what do they find difficult in their, for example, uh, Teams usage or, or Outlook usage. And then you can help them one-on-one. -on -one. And... When you say, when would you, well, what would you ad be your advice to IT leaders that are looking to measure the adoption? What kind of metrics you personally look into in your projects when you deal with clients? Like, what are some of the things that indicate that the company has adopted or hasn't adopted the, the Maxo teams in this case in a good way? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question because we have so, so many reports. You can go to N365 Admin Center, you can go to Teams Admin Center, you can check out productivity score, all of those, those things that are already made available in, in Teams or in Microsoft 365. Then you can also utilize Syskit or other tools where you have even the more reports and you can build your own on Power BI. So. If, uh, you, you, you shouldn't get lost in all of those different reports or, and things. And I would maybe suggest that you choose maybe three to five things you measure. And some of those should be uh, quantitative things. For example, if you want to increase the amount of uh, people conversating in channels versus having private chats, that could be one thing you measure. And then you should also measure some qualitative things. For example, are people happy with using Teams? Or what people are most frustrated in, with Teams? And then you can have specific trainings to uh, convert that frustration to happiness. Thank you. And if you could choose one feature that you are really looking forward that's going to be delivered to Microsoft Teams, is there something that you are really looking forward in, let's say, in the next year or so that you think would come and make your uh, life and projects more easier or more fun? I don't know. Uh, as a consultant, I'm working with several customers at a time. And of course, I have several tenants, so uh, several customer, organi um, customer environments uh, every day. And the shared channel functionality, so the Teams Connect is something I'm really, really looking forward to. So they announced it at Ignite. I think, but the schedule is at the moment that it will come out in 
October, November. So we just have a couple of more months to wait for that one. That's that's going to make switching between tenants much more, much more easier when you're working on projects. Okay, thank yeah. you, Carolina. Thank you for your session. Thank you for your Q&A, and we hope to see you here again very soon. So thank you. Thank you for coming.